afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. Um, my name is Lara Taylorson. I'm joined by my colleague Alison Ma from Hello. Transport London. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, we're this afternoon's um, double act. Um, uh, uh, you'll probably soon recognise that from both our accents that we both hail from the northeast. And um, whilst I can't promise to be quite as entertaining as Ant and Death this afternoon, we will hopefully, you, I hope you've found that this afternoon's presentation is interesting uh, and that maybe it strikes a chord with some of you within the audience. Uh, so, without further ado, let's kick off with the presentation itself, what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about building professions that's ready to learn. In particular, what we're going to talk to you about is an initiative that we set up um, about three years ago called Project Pyramid. Uh, Project Pyramid is about enhancing the internal capability of Transports for London's programme and project management community. And really, we're just going to spend the next 20, 20, 20 minutes or so telling you our story and experiences and, and what we've been through over the last three years. Um, I hope you didn't have too many glasses of wine over your lunchtime. <laughs> and so by telling you a story, I send you all to sleep. But hopefully, as I say, I hope you do find it interesting. I must fess up at this point as well. Uh, so I'm not from an L&D background. My background is project uh, management. Uh, so I will try to sort of you know, use the language that you guys are probably used to as much as possible. But Alison does come from a capability development background, so she'll tune in with you a lot more, I'm sure. So... How's the session going to run today? We're going to really talk you through the why. Why did we bother doing this thing called Pyramid in the first place? What was the business imperative? What was the drive behind it? There's going to be some reason why we want to enhance the capability of our project and program managers. Then I'm going to quickly tell you about the what. Well, what, what did we actually do about it? What was the scope? What was the solution? So we'll take you through that in a little bit of detail. And then I'm going to hand you over to Alison for the complicated bit um, to talk about the how we've gone about that, the iterative approach, approach that we've used and the different phases. Alison will have asked me and hopefully I'll get an opportunity to tell you some of the lessons learned. We'll probably pick up on some of those as we go through the presentation anyway. But some of the pitfalls and maybe things, if you are about to embark on something like this, maybe you can learn from, from, from our experiences. And I think um, we'll have some questions after you've done some jiggery-pokery with your little gadgets as well. Okay, so first stop on our journey this afternoon, talk about the why, the business imperative, the driver. So, <coughs> who have we got here then? Um, not quite, I'm a celebrity I'm afraid, but I'm sure you recognise the chap on the left. Uh, he's the Mayor, Boris Johnson. Um, I'm not sure if anybody might recognise the chap on the right quite so easily though. I'll put you out of misery. Um, it's Peter H his name's Peter Hende, he's the Commissioner of Transport for London. Um, Peter Hende reported into, the, into Boris, and obviously Alice and I reported to, into uh, Peter Hende. Very political environment we work in, you know, with the mayor and his, his, his transport strategy, etc. But Transport for London has a vision, and the words are there, I won't read them out to you. Any good organisation will have one. <coughs> a vision's good, but it, you need something to sit behind that vision so to enable it to happen. And I just want to take you back a few years, back to when we started Pyramid, back to 2005. <coughs> And what Transport for London did was um, uh, secure a five years, 50, sorry, £13 billion investment programme, which is called the Five Year Investment Programme. Prior to that, Transport for London really had um, suffered from year after year after year of annualisation. We'd had decades of underfunding. So it really gave us a great opportunity to have a real look ahead in terms of five years. Some of the projects that we need to do really needed that kind of look ahead. The East London Line, for extension, a massive great in infrastructure project taken a long time to, to implement. So it was a real coup for Transport for London to have that money and to have that look ahead. Um, now within that investment programme, I think Transport for London, I know what I'm talking about and I'm sure you're thinking buses and tubes and lots of other different modes of transport uh, within there as well. And rather than me sort of list and sort of list them all to you and go through them in minute detail because we could be here till the, till the, the early hours, I thought we'd play a little video which gives you a bit of a sort of view of the whole of Transport for London and all the different mo uh, modes, of, modes of transport. So hopefully... At the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. <laughs>
Yeah, hopefully that gave you a bit of a recap and a reminder of all the different facets within Transport for London, all the different modes of transport that we cover. That gives you sort of the background and sort of the context, but the five-year investment programme, we've got so many projects and programmes that we need to deliver in order to improve the, the overall transport system. So back in 2005, the, the Chief Officer recognised, well, with this huge investment programme, there's got to be some big old risks associated with them. Two of the top ones were around project delivery, ensuring that we do deliver what we said we're going to do, otherwise we're going to look a bit daft, and also making sure the right quantity and quality of people are in place, what Alan was talking about before, making, we have the right sh making sure we've got the right people with the right skills in the right places. And that's really my preamble to where Pyramid came in, really. We were set about to help mitigate those risks, um, and our vision was to in, uh, enhance the capability of our internal project and programme management community to enable that delivery of the five-year investment programme. Hopefully that gives you the context of why, what was the business driver behind it. I just want to quickly talk about the what, the solution. Now we thought of loads and loads of different ideas and things we could get, uh, we could do, but we really tried to keep the scope deliberately very, very tri uh, tight to make sure we could make some differences. Three key areas really. Firstly, the TFL PPM, Project and Programme Management Competency Framework, we created that. Now rather than creating our own thing in-house, what we tried to do was do some benchmarking, external benchmarking, see what was out there. We aligned very much with the Association for Project Management and the International Project Management Association, making sure that those linkages were in place. Once we create the competency framework, what we wanted to then do, bring that competency framework alive and get a wealth of data so we could see what our overall capability within our organisation was. So we procured, designed and procured an online development tool which brought the whole thing to life, allowing individuals to assess themselves against that competency framework, see what their profile is, see what their, what their strengths and weaknesses are, but then able to point them in the direction of development which is most suitable for them. Thirdly, and um, Alison will talk about this in a little bit more detail, but really creating a development portfolio for all levels within the project and program management community, which would help them sort of meet any gaps in their, in their uh, profile of assessment. Just a little bit more about what as well. So what we wanted to do was make sure we had some benefits out of this. When I was trying to write the business case for this originally, we wanted to make sure that we were going back and we were able to address that, mitigate those risks I mentioned before. The left-hand side are the three sort of uh, deliverables I mentioned. The yellow column, I can safely say that we are getting ticks in those boxes now, the measures of success. We have established a community. It's now at 1,400 people in total across Transport for London, all trying to deliver the five-year investment programme. We know what our um, priority capability needs are, we know what we're good at, we're not, what we're not so good at. We're now able to demonstrate, and Alison will show this, where we've enhanced the capability and we can actually show clear career development, career paths for everybody. The tricky bit for us is moving over to this far right-hand side in the pink column and really trying to see where, through this programme, where we can see some differences in terms of performance, changes in the performance of the projects and really is the holy grail. But we are seeing some changes. Um, the other ones that are reduced on reliance, externals, retention, etc. We are beginning to see some differences as well, but that's really where we're trying to push it towards really seeing those ultimate benefits. I'm going to hand you over to Alison now to take you through the how part. So, how did we go about building a learning and development portfolio that would enhance the capability of our programme and project managers? I'm sure as learning and development professionals, you recognise that particular root map that we use is a tried and tested route map of understanding the business, business imperative, as Lara has, has explained, conducting organisational and individual needs analysis to understand the, um, the need of our community, and from there moving through to designing and delivering programmes to address those needs. And it's very tempting at that point to run away and think, job done, but what we have done is stuck with it and moved through to attempting to evaluate the programmes to understand are they indeed making a difference. I think the one thing is to say here that we've been around this particular loop a number of times. It's definitely an iterative process and one of the things that has helped us to be successful and achieve some of our objectives is the continual involvement of the programme and project management community themselves in each part of this cycle. So in terms of needs analysis, first of all, we conducted an organisational needs analysis that gave us the overall themes for development for the organisation. Uh, that led us to two phases of development, one about raising the overall threshold of our community <coughs> skills, and then secondly, moving on to address the senior managers' 
and their particular needs. So phase one and phase two. So the organisational development gave us the key themes. The individual needs analysis, as Lara said, we rolled out to the community this online development tool. This gave us a huge wealth of information on individual needs and uh, wants for development. I think the danger is sometimes it can get crushed in the rush of the amount of data that you get through. But we did now know who was in the community, what they were able and capable of doing at the moment. That little triangular graph there shows you the skill levels of the community, benchmarked against the International Project Management Association. And the, the little graph along the bottom there, on the horizontal axis, we have the competencies and the vertical axis are the levels of competency. So you can see the kind of capability profiles we were able to generate at a modal, a departmental, or a team level to help us really target the development needs. And in, in good old Blue Peter speak, here's one we prepared earlier. Um, it's, it is a summary of the development portfolio as it stands today. Uh, we uh, affectionately know it is the blue bits and the pink bits. The blue bits, that is the, the phase one development, addressing the threshold needs of our program and project management community. The pink bits are the, the senior level programs. I won't go into the details of all of these programs to be pleased to know, but just to say that we did use the Association for Project Management qualifications as the backbone of the portfolio. So as people progressed through their careers of program and project management, they were aligning to a professional body. But I think our ultimate aim wasn't just to get people qualifications, it was the skills development. And we've worked hard with our training providers to ensure that our programs give people the opportunity to learn new skills, put them into practice, and work with their peers from across the organization. For example, the, um, the senior management programs, we have an orientation session with individuals before they move on the program, onto the workshop, we exchange expectations to ensure they really know what it's all about before they get there. The workshop themselves invites people from across the mode, so you meet people that you would never otherwise come across, but who actually do a very similar role to yourself. And then we have sort of four months and six months later, action learning workshops for people to share war stories, successes, failures, challenges. So we're just helping them to build their own network and own community. We've delivered over sort of 1,400 places on our programs to date. And I suppose the other little elements on this diagram show you the connection with the bigger world of TFL. We've been careful to complement and not duplicate activity from the TFL leadership program and the management development programs. And we've also um, done a huge amount of knowledge sharing, um, running knowledge sharing events with the community based on topics that they wanted to hear, either at breakfast time or at lunch time. And indeed, we have seen, we've moved into the area of mentoring and coaching to really help embed skills in the workplace. And I think that's certainly our challenges on an ongoing basis, is to make a difference in the workplace. So, moving through to, to what extent are these programs making a difference? Um, we have used the Kirkpatrick model of evaluation. Can I just see, is it, does that mean anything to people in the room, Kirkpatrick? I don't want to sort of preach to the converted. Um, so I'm sure you will have had similar stories to ourselves in terms of success rate. We have evaluated at a reaction level. We, we monitor the satisfaction with people on these actual programs and feed in their um, comments to ensure the programs are kept fresh and relevant. Because we are running um, qualifications with exams, there are group assessments, individual development assessment centres, we have uh, been able to monitor pass rates and the amount to which people have actually learned on these programs. And then we're getting into the two trickier areas of intermediate evaluation, to what extent has it made a difference in job performance, and I'll come to that in a moment in a little more detail. And finally, the ultimate level, which is where, as Lara said, we're trying to move into improving project performance in TFL. That is definitely a challenge for us. As, and as you can see on the right-hand side there, as accountability moves from the world of the project team out into the business, um, it is definitely more of a challenge to, um, to work with the business to say, well, what would be the success factors for you? 
but I'm pleased to say we do have some green shoots of um, success coming through there with some projects coming in uh, on a shorter time scale and indeed cost savings from uh, managing the risk profile. Just a little bit more on what we have done on the intermediate evaluation, the evaluation studies. Three key findings. I'll, I'll give you the bad news first. There were some organisational barriers preventing people putting their new skills into effect. A lack of opportunity to practice skills, which was indeed connected to the, the, the relatively weak culture of pre and post course briefings. So we found that some people were going on programmes without having a conversation with the manager about what they were going to learn. So when they came back, the manager wasn't prepared or inclined to give them the opportunity to put these new skills into practice. So again, some more challenges coming through. And indeed, we were also reminded of the, the skill versus will um, in terms of learning development professionals. If people are willing to learn, well, you can certainly make a difference. Um, if they're not willing to learn, you can send them on a zillion courses to no effect. But this skill versus will actually connected with the, the line manager's role in helping people to put their skills into practice. If they were willing, there was at least a fighting chance. It's very easy in the, the heat of the day to make the time to put um, these pre and post course briefings into practice. So that's the less good news and we are tackling some of those issues. The more positive news was we were able to see a shift in capability. What you'll see there are the competencies along the bottom again with the skill levels of the vertical axis. And you can see the blue line was our, our baseline of capability for the community. And when we reassessed a year on, we do have the red line which shows that improvement. But that's not sufficient. We want to know this improvement, what does it lead to in the workplace? Well, we were able to evaluate improved performance at an individual level. Feedback from line managers indicating that their staff were more confident to do their roles, uh, asking more constructive and challenging questions, and indeed being able to um, run their projects to better effect. Some other benefits would be around for those who had loads of experience but no qualification, it gave them a bit of a boost because they could cons consolidate that experience into a qualification. So you get a feeling and a recognition of your skills and experience. I've already mentioned some of the knowledge sharing benefits, but also we did, that did come through on the survey was improved motivation of employees. The fact that they were given the opportunity to do some qualifications, and indeed it showed TFL as an employer that really did value them, their skills, and indeed providing them <coughs> opportunities for career development. <coughs> so that's our quick whiz round uh, the learning and development cycle. I'll just hand over to Lara to take you through some of the lessons learned. Thanks, Alison. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you an, an idea of the, the, the process that went through. In terms of lessons learned, you know, absolutely vital, I think, of the, the top two around about clear governance and having senior level buy-in. Without those, I have to say, the permanent initiative wouldn't have worked quite as well as it has. Uh, we work in a very complex organisation, Transport for London, so making sure that we covered all the modes, making sure you've got representation from all the key areas, making sure they're involved in the process and the design. Um, that was absolutely key to make sure that they felt bought in and they, you brought the business along with you. Um, there had been a pre previous initiative that tried to do something very similar and they didn't have that senior buy-in as well, and I think that's one of the reasons why it perhaps didn't get to where it needed to. Uh, we had chief officers that sponsored this, so right at the top level, um, and that really helped drive it through. Um, third bullet point, the old um, sort of communication, 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 absolutely vital again. We did, um, over the first six months, at least 100 one-to-one -one briefings. We did 30 roadshows to about 1,000 people going out to the business. Again, getting the business involved with this and bringing them along, piloting things, trialling things, testing things, getting feedback from them as well. And not, not only you know, getting feedback, but acting on that as well. And that's really, really important. So they feel like they're part of the process and they're helping moving you forward as well. One of the things we didn't anticipate was really sort of the rapid growth in the community and making sure we could keep up with the, with the changes. Um, we, um, I think, in the first couple of months after we went live, we had sort of at least 250, 253 new people want to get involved. And I think it kind of showed that the momentum it was gathering and people were really interested and keen 
to have development and be part of this community um, and, and, and uh, uh, in terms of the importance of ensuring that capability was enhanced. So that was maybe something we were a little bit on the back foot on. Skill versus will, Alison's talked about. And then the last point, and really, again, Alison did mention this, but it's, it's the baton change or making sure that all the stuff that Pyramid does, but it's the link or the bridge back into the workplace and ensuring that people can put those skills in place. The pre and post course briefings, making sure those processes are really, really rock solid would have been, I think, a benefit in, in hindsight if we did it again. Just to sort of wrap up, I suppose, um, you know, initiatives like Pyramid, I really don't think, you know, from my experience, work if, if you're looking at it as a short-term solution. You really need to do something. This is in the medium to long term. This is a, we're in our latter part of our third year now, and we're only beginning to see some of the key benefits, and I think you need to be in the long term. We haven't talked about a lot of the other things that Pyramid do, knowledge sharing events, what we're doing on resource management, uh, what we're doing about systemic issues, etc. Because um, there's a lot more to, to, the, to the Pyramid um, uh, brand than, than we've mentioned. TfL, going forward, we're in the latter stages of that five-year investment programme. We're now looking out to 2017, 2018. We've got um, an investment programme that's £39 billion pounds taking us out to there. And the key challenges for us as a business are around the Olympics, obviously, and Crossrail coming in. Um, and making sure that, that the experiences and the knowledge and the capability we're building up through this five-year investment program, we can sort of bring them through um, to, the, to the challenges that we see going forward and see whether we can really improve on project performance. And I think that wraps it up. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.